Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss the hybridization of atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. This idea is a consequence of the valence bond theory. If we apply valence bond theory to hydrogen, as shown on the screen, we know that each hydrogen atom has one electron in a 1s orbital. Here we're going to denote the left hydrogen as hydrogen L and the right hydrogen as hydrogen R. And we see below the uh, orbital configurations 1s L1 and 1s R1, we see each one has a single electron and the line with the uh, red arrow denotes the 1s orbital having one valence electron, the electron being shown in red. You also note with a green oval, the fact that if we have one electron in an atomic orbital, we actually have space for another electron. You can also say that an orbital with one electron is half filled. A key idea of valence bond theory it is, is these half-filled orbitals that overlap with each other and in the process gain two electrons that are the key to uh, the standard covalent bond. The electron in each half-filled orbital helps to fill the other half-filled orbital with which it overlaps. We haven't shown the overlap here, we're just showing how the two electrons interact in such a way as to form a uh, valence bond bond. As a result of the overlap of the two different 1s atomic orbitals, we now have a single molecular orbital that has two electrons uh, that are paired. So we have to satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. And so we see we get the linear combination that we have in the middle that we can have the first electron, that's the 1SL1, and then the second electron is in 1SR, that's the 1SR2, or we can have the opposite convention where the second electron is in the left atomic orbital and the first electron is in the right atomic orbital. Here we have the ground state electronic configuration for carbon in the valence shell. And this poses a problem for valence bond theory in that since carbon has two half-filled orbitals, the 2px and the 2py, it seems that carbon should only be able to make two bonds. So we seek a rationale for why carbon tends to form four bonds and not two. Well, first, we can imagine that we can form an excited state by promoting one of the 2s electrons to the 2pz orbital. Now we see that we have four half-filled orbitals. So by the valence bond theory, carbon should be able to make four bonds, which we know is true from experience. We know in compounds such as methane that all four of the carbon-hydrogen bonds have exactly the same length, which suggests that they have the same energy. But it seems surprising because we notice that carbon has a 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals, all of which have different energies. We would like also to be able to rationalize the various geometries that carbon can entertain in its different compounds. So we come up with the idea of hybridization. Suppose that we mix, we hybridize 2s and the 2px orbitals. This mixing is shown as a coarse representation with this purple uh, balloon shown around those two orbitals.
in the hybridization theory, we now imagine that those two mix in such a way as to form two equally energetic sp orbitals. So we have the two sp's to the left, while the 2py and 2pz stay at the same energies they were before and remain unhybridized. So this is the general scheme for sp hybridization in carbon. We just take the carbon atom to the left, it bonds to the hydrogen to the left through an sp hybrid orbital on carbon, and it bonds to the carbon to the right with an sp orbital. The hydrogen doesn't hybridize, it still remains a 1s orbital. One feature we notice with sp orbitals is that they have a bond angle of 180 degrees to each other. The second and third bonds of the triple bonds. Uh, between the two carbons are pi interactions between the 2py and 2pz unhybridized carbon orbitals. Now let's suppose that we hybridize three carbon orbitals, 2s and two of the 2ps, and this uh, mixing hybridization is represented to show which orbitals are involved by this purple balloon around them. We imagine in the hybridization process, we now get three equally energetic hybrids. So now we have a triply degenerate, three sp2 orbitals that have the same energy, while as the 2pz orbital, which is unhybridized, is unaffected by this hybridization process, so its energy does not change. As well, the orientation doesn't change for the 2pz, but now the sp2 hybrids will now have a trigonal planar configuration and an angle of 120 degrees from each other. Here we see a calculation of ethylene. Each of the carbons is sp2 hybridized. So each carbon bonds to the two hydrogens and the neighboring carbon through this triplet of sp2 hybrids. The second part of the carbon-carbon double bond is formed from the unhybridized 2pz orbitals on each carbon atom. Finally, we can imagine a hybridization involving all four of the carbon valence orbitals, the 2s and the 3 2ps. The result is four orbitals with exactly the same energies that are now sp3 hybrids, having a mixture of the energies of 2s and the 2ps. They also are going to have a orientation in space that is tetrahedral with bond angles of 109 degrees and 44 minutes. Our classic example of sp3 hybridized carbon is methane. So we see methane, uh, one of the important examples that we started off with, we are able to explain the equidistant carbon-hydrogen bonds by the fact that all four of the bonds on carbon that interact with hydrogens are these sp3 hybrids. Can any other elements other than carbon undergo this hybridization process? Yes. So if we look at nitrogen, we notice that it has uh, five valence electrons. So we have two 2s electrons and then three half-filled 2p orbitals. So this is the ground state configuration for nitrogen. So let's first imagine that we have hybridization involving the first two orbitals, the 2s and the 2px. A difference here is now we see that hybridization is possible not only for half-filled orbitals, but for orbitals that have a lone pair in them, a fully occupied atomic orbital. If this hybridization process occurs for the first two, we get at two sp hybrids for nitrogen 
one of which is fully occupied and one of which is half filled. The other two uh, 2p orbitals remain exactly as they were before because they are unhybridized. As we saw for carbon, sp hybridization leads to a linear configuration. When you have two atoms, it has to be linear, but the lone pairs uh, that are part of the sp hybrids are not seen in the picture because we can't see the lone pairs. We've noted here the calculated bond length of 1.095 angstroms because this is a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. One of the bonds is an overlap of sp hybrids on each nitrogen. The other two are pi bonds involving the unhybridized 2py and 2pz orbitals on each nitrogen. Now we look at nitrogen where we hybridize three of the orbitals, one s and two of the p's. As expected, this gives us three isoenergetic sp2 orbitals, one of which has two electrons and the other two of which are half filled and therefore um, available for bonding. Here we have an example of sp2 hybridized nitrogen, a compound called diazine. And it may look surprising that the bond angle is about 106 degrees. We would expect that the sp2 hybrids uh, to be around 120 degrees in a trigonal planar configuration. However, because of the effect of the lone pair, we actually get a large distortion in the bond angle. We can verify that we really do have a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond by the slightly longer nitrogen-nitrogen bond length, 1.24 angstroms, as compared to the length that we saw for uh, nitrogen gas N2. Now we hybridize all four of the valence orbitals for nitrogen and we get four isoenergetic sp3 hybrids, one of which has two electrons and the other three of which are half filled. The half filled orbitals will be uh, used to form bonds and the filled sp3 hybrid will hold the lone pair. Our classic sp3 hybridized nitrogen compound is going to be ammonia. Now we apply the theory to sulfur. Sulfur is in the same family as oxygen. It has six valence electrons, two in a 3s and four in 3p orbitals as shown. We can promote one of the 3p electrons into a vacant 3d orbital and now by the valence bond theory sulfur should be able to form four bonds. Now let us imagine that we have mixing hybridization of all the filled or half filled orbitals on sulfur as shown on the screen. The result is five equi-energetic DSP3 hybrids, one of which contains a lone pair and the other four of which are half filled, available to form covalent bonds with other atoms. A classic example where sulfur has this hybridization is in sulfur tetrafluoride, which adopts a seesaw type structure. The lone pair on sulfur being uh, essentially above the diagram in the screen. It is one of the equatorial positions of the otherwise trigonal bipyramidal uh, SF4.
the result is six isoenergetic D2 sp3 orbitals, each of which is half filled. So therefore, sulfur in this hybrid configuration is able to make six bonds. The six D2 sp3 hybrids are all towards the corners of an octahedron. So therefore, SF6, a quite interesting gas, has an octahedral configuration with the sulfur being D2SP3 hybridized. The final element that we're going to look at, as far as hybridization goes, is iodine. Iodine has a valence shell uh, of the 5s and 5p orbitals with empty 5d orbitals that are nevertheless available. Here is the ground state configuration for iodine, showing the seven valence electrons, showing clearly that iodine is a halogen. We can promote one of the 5p electrons to a 5d orbital. Now with three half-filled orbitals, iodine in this configuration would be able to make three bonds. An example, which we're not going to show here, is iodine trichloride, where iodine has such a uh, imagined electron configuration. If another 5p electron is promoted to a empty 5d orbital, we now see a situation where iodine would be able to form five bonds because it has five half-filled orbitals. So let's imagine that these six shown filled or half-filled orbitals are hybridized on iodine. Result are six isoenergetic D2 sp3 hybridized orbitals on iodine. An example of such a compound for iodine is iodine pentachloride, which has this square pyramidal structure. Uh, we can imagine it as an octahedron where one of the positions is held by the lone pair on iodine. Suppose a third electron on iodine, the 5s electron, is promoted to a formerly empty 5d orbital. Now we see, through valence bonds, a rationale for iodine being able to form seven covalent bonds If all seven of these half filled atomic orbitals hybridize, we get as a result seven isoenergetic D3 sp3 hybrids. An example of such hybridization on iodine is iodine heptachloride, which we see has this pentagonal bipyramidal structure. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Be careful, stay safe out there, and as always, have a good one.